department at George Mason University. We were just talking. I joined Novak in 2000, so 16 years ago. And I said, Harold, were you there? And he said, yeah. So, thanks to Harold, Novak has a home. We have had the same home at George Mason University for a long time. And he helps make sure we don't get any parking tickets. Uh, at the university, if you don't have a sticker, you're screwed. So <laughs> we're on Sunday nights, so that helps. But anyway, uh, Harold, or we're glad to have you back. He's a frequent speaker to Novak and, and elsewhere in the area. Um, and it's, it's such an exciting lecture today on, on the New Horizons mission to Pluto, and he'll give some background pictures on that with the main uh, emphasis of his lecture is on the geology of uh, an impact basin called Sputnik Planum. And so I'm looking forward to that. Harold, it's good to have you back again. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. All right. Uh, I don't know how many of you were here last year when I first talked about Pluto when it was really sort of just taking place, but I hope there is uh, some nuances here that will uh, show you a little more, at least some better pictures that we've gotten since then, and uh, also give you a little different idea of what's going on. I will be talking about Pluto real quickly. Uh, as classified as a planet, dwarf planet, then again focus on the New Horizons mission to Pluto and its closest approach just a little over a year ago, July 14th, and some of the latest images from the New Horizons mission, and then uh, some discussion of the Sputnik Plenum region of that. And uh, New Horizons is continuing, and I'll just uh, sum things up after that. So, oh, uh, many of you, I shouldn't say all anymore, as, as, I, as we get older and older, there's more people who didn't know Pluto as a planet, as the young ones uh, do now. But again, considered uh, a planet up until 2006, even if it was known to be somewhat different, it was just the nine traditional planets, as you see I've pointed out here. And in 2006, it got its demotion to dwarf planet, and I'll be talking a little more about that at the end of uh, this talk. As you see here, just some details. I don't want to put you to sleep. Realize that it is very cold. It takes a lot of time to orbit the sun, so we have not been watching Pluto for its entire orbit. I mean, it was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh, and... That's just a small port, not even 100 years, and it takes 246 or so to go around the sun in Earth years. These are some of the, this is uh, put together. This was the best image from Hubble Space Telescope of Pluto and Charon. And uh, here's Pluto and Charon uh, as seen in uh, Hubble. Of course, it's false color just for uh, effect, just... <coughs> And again, it's so far away as you see here. 1930, where was it here? One of the interesting things about it that I do some point out, perihelion, closest approach to the sun in its orbit, was in 1989. And actually between 1979 and 1999, Pluto was actually closer to the sun than Neptune. It doesn't mean that it would hit Neptune ever, and they've worked this out. For years, you've got to realize space is three-dimensional. Just because it's at the same distance doesn't even mean it's in the same place. You know, you tilt that orbit, it's different. And just some of the things that took place since Pluto was discovered in 1930. 1957, launch of Sputnik, 69, Apollo landing, and then discovery of the moon, Charon, and some say Charon, um, 1978, perihelion, 19. 89, and then again, 19, again, 79 to 99, it was actually closer than Neptune. This is a comparison of some of the like uh, celestial objects, comparing the size of the Earth to Mars, Moon, Ceres, which is another dwarf planet, Eris, Charon, and Pluto here. <coughs> Here we see a comparison of Pluto. Yeah, if you could, uh, and again, it is spherical, of course, but as far as the diameter of Pluto would take up most of the, uh, from Midwest to 
all the western portion of the United States, and there is Karen. And Pluto, having been uh, <coughs> talked about as a name, in the upper left you actually see there was a stamp, not yet explored, 29 cent stamp, the USA. And, you know, just this May, they released, I have the uh, first day envelopes and stamps showing the Pluto image, full Pluto, and New Horizons. I think you should be able to still get these at the post office and look for them. And uh, I think online they may still have some of the uh, first day envelopes if you were interested. You know, I can remember as a kid collecting stamps. And uh, I know, I, I don't know of many kids who do anymore, but I thought that was a neat way to uh, spend some time, uh, you know, with my father and looking at the stamp collections and also my brothers. Uh, they just uh, don't do that these days. Everybody's with their own uh, computer playing games or the like. Pluto, of course, is also the name of the uh, Mickey Mouse's uh, friendly dog there. And uh, this is actually a guinea pig that I had that I named Pluto during the duration. He was still alive when the New Horizons mission got to Pluto. And Dr. Summers and I actually co-authored a children's book where we talk about Pluto the guinea pig, and make some comparisons to Pluto the, Pluto the dwarf planet. And here you see the uh, orbits of the five moons, uh, Pluto and Charon, and then uh, Nix and Hydra, and Kerberos and Styx. So there are five known moons of Pluto, uh, nothing compared to uh, Charon or Charon. And I really, uh, Alan Stern, many people know, he's the face of the New Horizons mission. He's also, uh, in my opinion, a very nice guy. Helped me a number of times getting materials to get to people to talk about Pluto and for my classes. He won the 2016 Carl Sagan Memorial Award. And my colleague Mike Summers actually won a George Mason Teaching Excellence Award in 2014. He's been recognized for other things as well. And the team overall won Aviation Weeks and Space Technologies uh, Laureate Award for Space Exploration, the Astronomical Society's Neil Armstrong Space Flight Achievement Award and the National Space Club's Goddard Memorial Trophy. So this is a highly awarded uh, mission that we're talking about. And you know, Alan Stern, the PI, is uh, large, you know, I mean, greatly responsible and a great leader for the team, and also very good at giving all the team members exposure and credit for the due. Mike Summers is on the uh, Pluto Atmospheres uh, team and uh, actually just, uh, what was it, last week, he and his colleagues, and they have Alan Stern's name in that paper as far as a byline, but is uh, <coughs> investigating the uh, atmosphere of Karen, in fact. Launched in 2006, so obviously it took a long time for this uh, spacecraft to get out there, and yet it ranks as the fastest flying spacecraft that human beings have produced. This is a picture of the takeoff. You can see the whole video online. Here is a shot of the uh, spacecraft in the f uh <coughs> nose fairling where they have it enclosed, and that's how it was set up. And this is the spacecraft with its instrumentation on its way. This is a trajectory. This is the uh, uh, where exactly it was passed in April of 2016, past Pluto and an on its way to a Kuiper Belt object that it is going to continue its mission. Here we see, you know, we just have been talking about this hurricane that passed by. So here is a bit of a comparison. This is, you know, not exact, but should be close to how the Earth would compare to the great red spot of Jupiter in size. And here we see 2005's hurricane Katrina, just to give you an idea of size. It's just amazing to think that over two planet Earths can fit across the diameter of the great red spot, which is basically, that you know, they like to say, a hurricane in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Uh, compared to Katrina hurricane, I mean, here's the uh, Central America, 
This wasn't taken this, oh, this is Africa, excuse me. Um, this wasn't taken the same day, but you can imagine this is enormous. This is just comparing the earth to the great red spot, and that's comparing uh, Katrina to the United States. Remember how big uh, that is. And here we see, taken again, the earth compared to the great red spot and Katrina to scale, okay? So here actually is when it is forming, and right here, this area, which, you know, is puny compared to the great red spot of Jupiter. Again, it's the same physics associated with these systems. New Horizons also took an image of Io. This is, not, this is the image taken by New Horizons. This is an image by the Galileo spacecraft, if you weren't aware. Io, a significant sized moon of Jupiter, the innermost Galilean moon, is the most volcanically active uh, surface in the solar system that we're aware of. I still remember that day in 1979 when a uh, grad student um, was uh, on uh, duty and took a look at the pictures coming in from the Voyager spacecraft and got to see the uh, first plume of a volcano on something other than the Earth. It was just incredible. Um, and again, these are pictures of Io. This is a close-up by the Galileo spacecraft. Just incredible, active surface. And here you see, it's not really a video, it's time-lapse. Took many pictures, the New Horizon spacecraft, as it passed by, and there you see a volcano erupting. And, you know, to me, that's a great thing. And I uh, could imagine if you're a geologist and for the first time you see a volcano erupting on the surface of an object other than the Earth. This is a time-lapse of images taken by the New Horizons spacecraft as it was approaching Pluto. <coughs> and here again we see uh, time-lapse imagery from 2015 as it's approaching. Remember, close close towards July. These are images from April 2015, just um, anywhere from 70 to 80 days away from the close encounter with Pluto. And it also highlights sticks, uh, Kerberos, Hydra, Nix, and sticks. <coughs> And that's just a freeze frame of that. And here we see on July 1st, the uh, New Horizons spacecraft able to take a wide field of view image of the uh, system. And as we see, oops, gotta be careful. Um, Pluto and its largest moon, Charon or Charon. And this is just trying to give you an idea of the mapping. Here's where the heart is, as we call it today and its orientation from July. What was that? And this is just giving you an idea of how some of these are put together to give you, you know, Ralph gives you a natural color. The reflectance is better measured with the Lari instrument. And so you combine the two and you get a better contrast of where there's, you know, the um, plain regions and mountains and the like. This is a color image taken July 8th, 2015, just uh, a week before the closest encounter. Here's a black and white image from July 10th. And here we see July 12th as we're getting closer. And they were already beginning to pick out features, and it was very clear by this time that Pluto was going to be anything but a boring surface. Karen also, I'm not going to focus as much about it, but there are differences there. Chasms, polar region, impact craters. Even Pluto, as a dwarf planet, has so many of the same features that we uh, compare to our own Earth and other terrestrial planets, even though it is very different as a icy planet. I'll be talking about that as well. Here we're getting close to the closest encounter. This is July 13th, Karen, so it's already there. This is false color highlighting certain features. There's a region of the heart, and this is Sputnik Plenum, in fact. And the colors are for different 
chemical constituents, and I'll talk about that as well. So July 14th, 2015, just a little over a year ago, and uh, as I pointed out in the, um, well, in the Alcon conference, for those of you who were there, I talked about July was the 40th anniversary of the landing of the Mars Viking lander on the surface of Mars, and of course, uh, Neil Armstrong taking footsteps on the moon in uh, July of 1969. A lot seems to go on in the summers. This gives you an idea of the orbital path of the craft around, uh, through the plane of Pluto and Chiron. And now I gotta go back up. So what were we hoping to learn? There were a number of things that we really were trying to figure out. You know, chemical composition, you do that through spectroscopy. Uh, types of materials, the only ices, or there's also rocky material there. Uh, the different markings, the different variations in its reflectance, something that we wanted to get a better handle on. Uh, is Pluto geologically active? That's what I'll be talking about. Uh, we knew it had an atmosphere early on. So the uh, question is, how's that? And also there were a lot of people who were saying, gee, we better get to Pluto soon because as Pluto... Remember, Pluto's uh, perihelion was back in 1989. And there were some who said, you know, the ices would uh, sublimate, turning directly from solid to gas as sublimation, uh, as opposed to vaporization, which is liquid to gas. So the ices, the icy material would sublimate as it got closer, and probably you had the maximum atmosphere just around 1989, 90, 91. But as it gets further and further away, it gets colder, and the atmosphere is literally going to deposit. When going directly from gas to solid, it's called deposition. And so there you have a situation of let's get to it before it loses all the atmosphere. And that was part of the thing that these guys were pushing. You know, Mike Summers was uh, working with um, Alan Stern on trying to push forward for the mission. He started back in about 30 years ago, I think. What did Mike tell me? I think one of the first meetings about the New Horizons mission was in the late 80s, about 86, 87. They were saying, let's try to get a mission before, you know, the gases uh, deposit back on the surface, solidify, and we can look at the atmosphere and the like. And th there are a lot of ups and downs, of course, as with all missions. And then I'm going to, you know, dwarf ice planets that are out there, and then a uh, question about what is really the best way to define a planet. Uh, as far as playing with, thi this is what they had uh, beforehand. This is, you know, what they were wondering, what the structure of Pluto is like, and, uh, you know, they've learned a lot more, but they were able to estimate, well, you know, if it's frozen, solid, different types of material, and notice sublimation winds, different kinds of uh, winds, but that's because we deal with evaporation, <coughs> excuse me, evaporation winds or vaporization winds instead of sublimation winds. And uh, because of the density, we knew there had to be a rocky core at some place. Uh, but then also, as the temperature increases towards the interior of the planet, could you have, with the proper temperature and pressure, a uh, liquid region, liquefied region? We'll talk more about that. And as far back as 1980, a lot of people like to uh, fantasize, I say, but, you know, this is speculation and science. Uh, back in uh, 1980, so that's 36 years ago, this uh, well-known writer and popularizer of astronomy, Roy Gallant, uh, talked about what might be found on Pluto, but you know, obviously it wasn't, and it was totally speculative, but that's okay to speculate. On July 14th, as you see, these guys and gals were uh, very happy that uh, the New Horizons mission uh, verified that it had 
got by Pluto. Uh, and I, I do want to point out we are still receiving material from Pluto. Uh, that'll be taking place through even, I believe, up around November, around Thanksgiving. We've got about 85% of all the imagery. But it's a very slow data rate because you have a very limited uh, communications ability. They don't have Wi-Fi on Pluto. We've got to go back and just radio transmit to the, and NASA only has three ground stations on Earth that can communicate with the spacecraft called the Deep Space Network. So it has an effective, very low, uh, bit, you know, data stream coming across, just like the old days. I mean, I can remember when um, we often dealt with uh, 300 baud, right? That's 300 bits per second. And then maybe you were getting 1,200 and then came 9,600. Boy, you were blazing speed. You know, your Ethernet connections on the 1 to 10 megabit per second is obviously a heck of a lot faster. But because of the limited linkages to the satellite, the New Horizons spacecraft, it has taken all this time. And they had to determine, you know, what pictures to take, what spectroscopy and everything, and then how to download that. So in some cases, you know, the images came first, even though in a way the more important scientific data was held to later. The thing is, is that with the pictures, or the uh, team was hoping that the uh, public would be entranced with all this and it kind of has worked out that way. So here is the uh, best image at that time that was uh, taken by the New Horizons spacecraft in uh, true color. It also took a picture of, as I said, Hydra is not much and you see it's all pixelated here. It was uh, very bright. It actually is a little better on screen on the computer than it is up there. This is really all washed out but there is some differentiation on the uh, high definition screen and comparison of Nix and Hydra's far as size to the metropolitan Denver area. This is Denver downtown, there's Boulder, Colorado, Hydra and Nix, relatively small chunks of rock in a sense. And as I said, a key thing is spectroscopy and telling you, you know, th there's, there's none of this color on the uh, planet itself. Sorry, dwarf planet. But the idea is, is that you're seeing, okay, in, in the infrared, you can pick out, there's a lot of methane. Of course, it's frozen. It's frozen, solid methane that's in those particular regions, and we'll be talking more about that. There's the best image of Karen that was uh, downloaded already. And uh, now getting to some close-ups. The mountains, which turned out to be mostly ice, and the way you know that, again, is spectroscopy. You've got to realize that the spectral data is what gives us the most information about the composition. And there we have uh, Karen's mountains uh, in the, you know, when they say moat, it's not water. Please remember, it is not liquid water of any kind. There, everything's frozen solid, even things that we would normally find as gases here on Earth. Now, this is one that Mike had given me a while back, but showing Pluto does have an atmosphere, and the extent of Pluto's atmosphere is actually much larger than originally thought. They thought the atmosphere, a lot of nitrogen, going out about 170 miles, but a small part of that goes out almost 100, not 100, 1,000 miles, very loosely, you know, gravitationally bound to the planet. In fact, Karen is sweeped up in some of this as it gets some of that nitrogen gas trapped in its own gravitational well. So some interesting playing going along here. Here's Pluto and Charon again as New Horizons was passing by and you're seeing again it really looks like almost a binary planet because Charon is more much you know considerably more than half the size of Pluto. Carbon monoxide, high concentration, and here's the heart and Sputnik plenum over here. So, you know, this is frozen carbon monoxide, frozen methane, frozen nitrogen. And mountains are largely water ice, frozen, of course. Uh, 
And you know, that's incredible and very different than anything you're going to find here on Earth and different than any other uh, region of our solar system. There was also the shock bow of you have a Pluto with the nitrogen atmosphere traveling through space and you have this solar wind with charged particles. That's what the solar wind is coming by and we're trying to pick up the uh, interplay between the solar wind and this atmosphere of Pluto. And here's a central region of the heart <coughs> as taken and here you see this is 20 miles so as you see some of these this whole region is one two three four five six seven eight nine about you know it's a little under 200 miles about 180 miles going diagonally across and you see this uh, formation that looks like at one point there was frozen material that was floating in there and that's obviously what happened before it all just froze solid. And again, I want to note that these mountains were determined to be largely water ice. So it's almost like having an iceberg that now is frozen in place within a, to the right, this is largely uh, nitrogen, there's carbon monoxide, and um, just about everything else is frozen. We'll get to some of the more interesting aspects of the surface of Pluto there. Here is Nixon Hydra again, not well uh, delineated just because of where they were in their orbit as the New Horizons spacecraft passed by. They weren't in an ideal situation in order to uh, catch the image. So this is Nixon Hydra. Again, true color image, very uh, good resolution on that. And as far as if you use a Mercator projector projection for a map, here you'll see the features. <coughs> and you see here is the uh, Tombar region, is that whole region of the heart. And the southern portion of that is Sputnik Plenum, which I'll be talking about in a little more detail. By the way, I am supposed to say that none of these are the official names. That has to go through the International Astronomical Union, those same guys that demoted Pluto in 2006. And hopefully when they do uh, vote on this, they'll have a full contingent of astronomers, uh, not just the hangers-on that stayed to the very last day in 2006 when they took the vote. So there's a lot of things you ought to uh, consider. So again, as uh, Alan and Mike Summers like to point out, you know, these are not official names. But, you know, if I'm going to be talking about the region, what am I supposed to call it? You know, s start with something. I think those guys did a pretty good uh, job. Hayasbusa Terra, Pioneer Terra for the Pioneer spacecraft, Voyager Terra for the Voyager spacecraft, Viking Terra for the Viking spacecraft. Naming these, I think, a very reasonable Clyde Tombaugh, the discoverer of Pluto. Why not? And then even talk about, you know, they were very international. Sputnik Plenum. So I will be using these names even though they not. Uh, blessed by the IAU, right? And uh, here's Karen and its uh, named regions. Again, unofficial. Vulcan Plenum, Serenity Chasma, Argo Chasma, uh, Tardis Chasma, Macris, uh, and uh, Vader Crater. <coughs> And, yeah, I mean, they're also somewhat comical, but, you know, they do that with the named nebulae as well, so why not? So one of the things that, uh, now I'll uh, talk even more about this, regions on Pluto that don't have impact craters are relatively young. Now, by relatively young, I'm not talking about a few years or a few hundred years or a few thousand. They were talking about less than 100 million years old. But we'll see where within regions of Sputnik Plenum, there's evidence that it's even younger. You're talking about it has to be less than 10 million years old. The um, regions near Sputnik Plenum that I'll be showing in uh, more detail. Again, so there's some kind of resurfacing process that is taking 
place, you know, some of its convection of the material and movement, but not exactly plate tectonics because this isn't any silicon-based rock material. This is all frozen ice. But a key thing is it implies a source of energy, uh, and we really want to find out more about that. Alan Stern and a few others from the team, including Mike Summers, are already putting together a proposal for a landing mission on Pluto. Remember, we just flew by. Now wouldn't it be nice to have a lander on Pluto? Can learn a lot more and get a lot more oohs and ahs for the images. So again, the uh, Sputnik Plenum, uh, the southern portion of Tombaugh Regio here, and what I'll be talking about, and they also named the Aladrisi Mountains, the, uh, I don't even know how to say that one, Norge Montes Kroon Regio. And again, this is what I'm going to be focusing on in this region down here that you'll see shortly. That's just a specific region of the, you know, portion of that heart of Tombaugh Regio. So this specific region, Sputnik Plenum, is 350,000 square miles. <coughs> uh, that's larger than the state of Texas, by the way. Mostly flat, ringed with mountains, two to three miles above surface. Remember, those mountains are water ice, it's like icebergs. Uh, probably the remnants of an impact basin and uh, an ancient collision. It's a hundred. Uh, Oh, a Kuiper Belt object that they estimate was 100 miles across. We do this estimation by the amount of energy you would need, you would need to create that uh, diameter region. On that whole Sputnik Plenum region, remember this is, you know, the size of, you know, greater than the size of the state of Texas, you're looking at no detectable craters. This is what tells us, you know, this surface is really young. It's got to be less than 10 million years. And also, and we'll show some of the evidence of thermal convection in the ice region of Sputnik Plenum. Again, Sputnik Plenum, that southern region of the Tombar Regio, is basically a nitrogen glacier. You know, instead of a water ice glacier, it's a nitrogen ice glacier, and that's what you're looking at, and that's all of this. And it's very bright because it's frozen solid nitrogen, but there are other things there. And when you get a close-up look at the edge, I believe this is the lower left edge here, you begin to see, didn't come out as well, it's actually better on the screen than that screen, uh, sorry, but you actually can see, you know, you have those kind of cells here, polygonal cells, but apparent ice flows that had taken place. They may be frozen solid now, but there is uh, actually there's some uh, evidence of uh, movement based upon some of the uh, uh, ranging data that they have using uh, LIDAR and uh, movement of some of this. So they know the uh, small direction, but you know, Nitrogen ice is, is still flowing. It flows as fast as a glacier, right? Which is dawn slow unless it really thaws and basically you lose that. And here, and as you see, again, here's the heart region and the southern portion of that heart region all broken up into these polygonal cells. Looks very much like the uh, Arctic sea ice. Uh, which I actually did some research in about 20 years ago, and ice flows. And so you're looking at some regions off to the left here at the edge of this nitrogen ice glacier. And so when you uh, look real close at that, again, this is pretty good black and white. There is those polygonal cells that you see, probably uh, an indication of what had been upwelling and downwelling a material, uh, just like the uh, sunspots and the like. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the upwelling of the plasma. You know, it's not as cold, of course. It's dawn hot on the surface of the sun. <coughs> and that material comes up, 
the warmer material is going to come up, colder material will go down during this, uh, when the convection cycle was taking place. So that's right at the edge of, again, the uh, nitrogen ice glacier going into the water ice mountainous region of Sputnik Plenum. And again, unofficial name, and you see that these guys do have a sense of humor calling this particular feature here, it's up here. And that reminded someone, probably an astronomer with a few too many beers, of a Klingon warship shape. So if you take a look from the original Star Trek and the Klingon warship, it may look a little like that, but again, probably had a few too many beers. Uh, main point is, that is, this is water ice bergs or water ice mountains frozen now in place in the nitrogen. This is largely nitrogen, but there is some carbon monoxide and, and of course, carbon dioxide also frozen in there. Yeah, that's what I want next. And this, again, resolution here isn't quite as good as what's on the computer screen. But, you know, a little, f uh, f this is kind of upside down of some of the, uh, the images, but there's the uh, polygonal cells, and here's the mountains, Norgay Montes, Hillary Montes. And remember, these so-called Montes or mountains are basically icebergs frozen in place. And now, with color imagery and some spectroscopy, it noted that there was this reddish ejector from certain regions, and also this material, you know, this is an unusual thing. What kind of volcano do you have? This is not a geologic volcano like even on Io or the Earth. This is something erupted from beneath the solid, some liquid expelled, expelled out from this uh, eruption. And the strange thing is it's got this reddish color. What are we talking about. And there's actually a lot that's talked about with this uh, material known as uh, tholins. Uh, real quick, as you see, there's also, gee, dried up lake over here. There's lots of features. This is not uninteresting. This has lots of geologic features, really uh, just specific to an icy planet like Pluto is, and we believe many others may be similar uh, in nature, but, you know, we need to go see what's going on. And here, you know, this region here, close up here, and you see, you know, what kind of valleys are this? This is not going to be water ice. And in fact, none of the material will probably flow in a liquid form based upon the temperatures and pressure that we have record for on the uh, surface of Pluto. So these would be like uh, rift canyons. Uh, in other words, you know, the Grand Canyon is a river canyon. But in Africa, there's a famous uh, rift canyon, which many years ago, in uh, class with um, uh <coughs> oh, Mike Summers was teaching that class when I was a grad student. And I compared the Rift Canyon in Africa to the Valles Marineris. Valles Marineris is not a river canyon. It is also a Rift Canyon. But the whole idea is, so this is indicative of really, well, this is tectonics, not taking place now. But in the past, obviously, the crustal material was faulting and bumping along, just like our tectonic plates do today on Earth. But this is, you know, billions of uh, years ago, perhaps on Pluto. We also uh, talk about snow-capped mountains, but please understand that is not, uh, that's not ice snow, that's not water ice. And I'll show you some of that a little more uh, defined shortly. Back to, this actually got a little out of order, I was trying to talk about that reddish colored material, it's called tholins. It's actually a type of organic material that was first named that by Carl Sagan and his team back in the 60s when they were looking at a uh, <coughs> material accumulated 
to their rendition of what's called the Yuri Miller experiment, which is trying to simulate the early days on Earth and then see if you can create some complex organic molecules. Another misunderstanding is people say, oh, Yuri and Miller were trying to create life from non-life. No, they were trying to show that from simple inorganic materials, you can develop complex organic materials. And they succeeded. And we believe all of that red veneer is what's called tholin, so there's a lot of organic material. And um, here you see when Sagan, this is from the 1979 article, when Sagan and Bashun Kar uh, put forward this Tholen definition, uh, complex organic solids for mixtures of methane, <coughs> ethane, ammonia, water, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and the product synthesized by ultraviolet radiation light discharge, which is part of, if you go back and look at the uh, Uri Miller experiment and how they tried to simulate the original atmosphere of the Earth and then bring forward organic material which ultimately would uh, become part of life. And here, so they propose as a model-free descriptive term, tholins, and they even came up with, you know, that's Greek for muddy and also for vault or dome. So they have this all laid out. And the name comes from 1979, but it's real neat that now here, uh, almost 40 years later, we're using it extensively for material that was formed not on Earth, not through special experiments to show that organic material can be created from inorganic uh, material, but actually on the surface of Pluto. <coughs> and this is one of the more recent publications, just this year that came out, looking at the uh, Sputnik Plenum uh, region, and this is the Al Idrisi Mountains in the northwest of that region and uh, unfortunately the um, caption didn't come out but you know explaining the different regions remember again the uh, mountains are largely just water ice like ice mountains that are there in that region <coughs> and uh, right here you're looking at nitrogen and then you know it was defining what it was uh, discovering in the other regions that it was able to determine spectroscopically. And let's see, did I miss something? Come on, there, it's working now. All right, and here we see east of the Sputnik plenum to the east. They're also looking at, well, gee, there's even gullies here. How did those gullies form? One of the questions, pitted uplands, glaciers, bladed terrain. How did all this take place? This is, you know, material that will be studied for years, for years, we'll be able to be looking at this and hopefully maybe we'll get another mission so that we can even learn more, get more of an up close and do some, and what they're hoping to do with the land, of course, would be some uh, in place, right there, not uh, remotely, but grab some of that material and do the analysis just like the Curiosity rover or the Viking lander back in 1976, grabbing soil and then doing the chemical analysis. And here we see some of the other features, washboard regions, they're called dissected terrain, mountainous, alpine, they came up with fancy names for this, plateau region. And here again, there's Sputnik plenum. And here we see what is the plateau, alpine region, washboard terrain, fluted region, dendritic, you know, these uh, fractures, which certainly indicate that, you know, some major fracture took place, then materials sloughed down. What are these uh, conditions, and why did they take place the way they did? And also from this uh <coughs> paper uh, just published a few months ago about the Sputnik plenum region, uh, as you see, we're talking about uh, mounds with depressions and summits, and you have to look at the altimetry. This is elevation scale. This is colored for elevation. The uh, lowest elevation is actually B, so what you have, you know, it's almost like a cratered region. Is this a uh, impact crater that then filled in 
as time went on? Uh, or is it, just the other way, as I say, cryovolcanic contribution, the fact that material came up from below, so weakened the structure and the uh, caldera region goes down and material is ejected outside. What are you looking at and there's different ways to form. So as I go, you know, and I was going to end early so I can take questions uh, after that. <coughs> And uh, let's take a look at here what New Horizons is doing after Pluto. And it is uh, commissioned to go forward and look for a Kuiper Belt object. And here is the, uh, well, later on, 2006 launch, fly by Jupiter 2007. And they actually did a burn in December of 2015 that would give it the trajectory towards this PT. One is where it's going, mid-2018 to 2019, if all goes well. And this is the New Horizons image. It's a time-lapse photography. It's not a video, really. The green is around the PT-1, which is what it's aiming for at this point. As far as the size of PT-1, here's the, uh, uh, what's the bay in Massachusetts? Cape Cod region of uh, Massachusetts. Size comparison to PT-1, rather small Kuiper Belt object. The idea is to try to learn more about it. Notice how, I mean, here they basically shape it like a marble. Highly doubt that that's the way it is. What we're saying is a lot of us believe it'll be a rather interesting solid surface, but, you know, with things that would point to some activity when it formed. So as far as the question, everybody's favorite, even though it's the silliest thing, there is because it doesn't matter what you call it. It still is there. It's got lots of features. It has a geology. It has five moons. It has weather. It has an atmosphere. And one of the problems of, you know, saying, well, it's not a planet is, you know, we talk about extrasolar system planets, exoplanets. Th there are some exoplanets that share the same orbit as best we can make out. By this definition, they wouldn't be called planets. So maybe I shouldn't call them exoplanets, but something else. It just all gets very muddy when you really get down into it. So it's all just a silly uh, gambit, really. Yeah, Pluto is small. And there were a number of people who didn't want to include Pluto beforehand, but they never made as big a deal of it as Mike Brown did, who basically wanted to say that he discovered uh, Planet Nine He's in the part of this uh, new planet nine thing. So there's a lot of, um, you know, politics and ego and, you know, I want to be such and such. Uh, and true, it doesn't fit uh, terrestrial or the gas giants. Uh, most of, um, not, mo uh, you know, it's hard to say numbers. But I can tell you as far as, you know, Mike Summers and I, you know, Alan Stern just wants Pluto reclassified as a planet at this point. He, he wants, you know, after all, you know, spend all this time, let's explore the ninth planet. You know, that was Pluto. And then after it launches and it's on the way to Pluto, oh, we're going to say that it's not a planet anymore. So he's real ticked off, and there is some bad blood between him and Mike Brown, to say the least. But many of us feel this is all silly, and what we should be doing is focusing on the fact that there's really three classes, excuse me, <coughs> three classes, <coughs> excuse me, one sec. Three classes of planets in our solar system. And um, that would be, excuse me, the first class terrestrial planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Terrestrial planets, rocky, etc. Gas giants Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then the icy. Planets. That's how many of us just feel it should be. And three classifications, and that, that's the best way to teach it as well. Terrestrial, gas giant, and icy type planets. And again, Pluto is one of many, maybe there may be thousands, who knows exactly how many are out there. But, you know, we're finding, well, gee, now they say, oh, now I've discovered Planet Nine or the like. Well, it's only because you got you know, Pluto declassified as a planet that now you're trying to say uh, what you discovered is number nine. 
that's just silly. There's going to be a lot more of these, and their orbits get more and more irregular. In fact, this is a young lady who was at a talk I gave just um, a week ago Monday at our uh, public observing talks at uh, George Mason University that you all are welcome to come. We do it typically twice a month. Uh, the, uh, weather, of course, dependent as far as when we do it, etc. but you can look it up online. And uh, as you see, you know, her T-shirt says, it's okay, Pluto, I'm not a planet either. And Pluto's here crying off of the heart region. It's real uh, cute. And actually, I, I, I asked, uh, her father was with her, and she was uh, there. I said, gee, can I take a picture of this? And I tweeted it out. It got like 20,000 hits. <laughs> it was just um, amazing, just with certain little things. So 20,000 people have seen this young lady with her... Pluto t-shirt, and it's okay that it's not called a planet. Again, as far as this question of planet or not, it goes back to this IAU definition, which is three-part, uh, must be in orbit around the sun. Well, that's pretty easy. There's lots of stuff in orbit around the sun. Large enough that it takes, you know, even this, a nearly round, and really it's a nearly spherical shape, that's not specifying, you know, mathematicians and physicists laugh at us. You know, you can even classify ellipses you know, as eccentricity zero to one. Where zero, it's perfectly circular orbit. And one would actually be a straight line. But, you know, point nine nine is really elongated and really stretched out there like a uh, Cuban cigar or something really pulled out. So it's not mathematically stated. There is no hard, uh, well-formed formulation for this definition, which is another reason why many of my astronomy colleagues have a problem with that. And then number three is really where supposedly it fails. It's cleared its orbit of other objects. Ah, well, it crosses the orbit of Neptune. Obviously, it hasn't cleared its orbit of everything. Well, it's also a lot smaller than Neptune, but one of the problems that you have that Mike Summers will point out, and here uh, it says, you know, Pluto revolves in an orbit that, well, the orbit, when flattened on a plane, intersects that of Neptune. I told you, in three-dimensional space, it never actually intersects. Yeah, it's three dimensions. You've got to think in other than two dimensions. But if you flatten them both out, you know, you see, ooh, it's... And as I said, between um, 1979 and 1999, Pluto was actually closer to the sun than Neptune. Yeah, I know. There are people who say, well, then Neptune didn't clear out everything in its orbit. But, you know, another thing is, Mike points out, if you put Earth in the orbit that Neptune is, then it wouldn't be called a planet. And so just doing it by that is just, well, in his view, and many others, uh, silly. Th they really need to redo the definition. And I will tell you that, you know, the committee set up, they were like, seven or nine on this committee that was set up originally to look at it, they actually did not come up with, you know, um, decrease the number of planets. They wanted to increase. They wanted to call Ceres, which is now a dwarf planet, and Pluto. They wanted it to be 11 official planets of the solar system and then the other objects. But their desires were also ignored. So you see, there was a lot of politics. If the recommendation of the committee that was set up to look at this, if their recommendation is ignored, then, you know, what's going on, people? So this is, as I was saying, terrestrial planet zone, giant planet zone, and then, you know, this third zone of icy dwarf planets. And that, we think, also will better allow uh, teachers to explain how our solar system is broken up in this type of differentiation. And this just gives you some of the information about Pluto, if you were curious, five known moons, 3.7 billion miles, that's the average distance. Sometimes it's greater and reaches four, and sometimes it's less. You'd weigh about 1 15th what you weigh here. So, you know, if you were 105 pounds here, you'd only be 15 pounds on Pluto. So you can look at it that way. Notice this is 248. Uh, the other one is at 246. Well, we haven't seen one complete orbit yet, so we're really basing it on extrapolations which haven't ever 
associated with it. Uh, diameter, almost 1,500 miles. And again, the New Horizons spacecraft moving now at 36,000 miles an hour, the fastest man-made spacecraft uh, that there is. And it took 3,463 days from launch to intercept with the uh, dwarf planet Pluto. At the closest distance, it was 7,800 miles above the surface. And it was taking pictures and spectroscopy, putting all of that into memory, and then slowly feeding back. And as I said, about 85% is now done. <coughs> so there's still things to learn about it and still things that, you know, even pictures and scientific data that were taken at the time that haven't come out from it. And it's uh, nine hours time needed to communicate a round trip from us to the spacecraft, and then we always get the acknowledgement that it received its instructions, like on the change in the uh, trajectory in order to go to PT-1. Uh, it really is cold. Surface of Pluto is anywhere from 45 to 35 Kelvin. That's minus 378 to minus 396 Fahrenheit. 378 to 396 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Absolute zero is, I love the way this rounds off. This says 460. They really round it off. You know, it's like, what, 454 point something? 459. Um, that's 273 below zero centigrade. Oh, and just a tidbit that I always throw in because I learned it so well. You know, there is a point where the temperature on Fahrenheit and Celsius are the same. Anyone know who that is? Okay, 40 below zero is the same 40 below centigrade, Celsius, or 40 below Fahrenheit. That's the same exact. Uh, zero degrees Kelvin, there is no such thing. It's zero Kelvin. Yeah, today they just use, uh, Kelvin is, there's no degree needed for that because of the uh, nature of how that's defined. And here you see some information about the moons, Kirin, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. Uh, the other four, Nix and Hydra, if you didn't uh, realize this, gee, who discovered this? Nix is with an N, Hydra H, the New Horizons spacecraft. That's why they have picked a name with an N and an H. And then Kerberos and Styx. And as far as the long road, yeah, I was uh, about right. What we're talking about, <coughs> well, it was 1990 when S NASA sponsored the first. And as I said, Mike Summers was working with Alan Stern, I believe beginning in like 1987, and looking at what they would do for a mission to Pluto. And what will it do uh, for us? Not only teach about the moons and its orbit, what it looks like, possibility of what's going on beneath the surface of both Pluto and Charon, and the craters of Pluto, and uh, at one point, some thought that it might have a ring system, and it turned out not to be the case. Uh, a few years before, about 2009, 2010, there was an article appeared in uh, Astrophysics Journal that, um, you know, they ran a simulation, and it is possible for Pluto to maintain a uh, ring system of some kind. Well, didn't pan out, but that's the whole point of experimenting versus just looking, uh, or just uh, playing with your computer models and said, well, this is possible. Well, maybe possible, that's not the case. And here we just see the uh, comparison of speeds, how fast different objects go, or is a human being at three miles an hour, or running, you know, those that are doing the 100 yard dash, 100 meter dash, excuse me, you're looking at about 27 miles an hour. Horses can go 50 miles an hour. Cheetahs, 70, but only for a short time. <laughs> you were wondering, there are uh, antelope and uh, other type that can run at about 60 miles an hour for a longer period of time because they're prey and they have to escape, but the cheetah can, you know, go real fast, pick up on some of those. Peregrine falcons have been clocked at up to 200 miles an hour because they've got an advantage flying through the air. Jet planes, speeding bullet is about 1,700 miles an hour, if you were wondering. The space shuttle, which no longer exists, was 18,000 miles an hour. And again, New Horizons, 
the fastest object, fastest man-made spacecraft that uh, we have built. And again, looking towards the future and what's going to take place, <coughs> we have the uh, New Horizon sending back its data and information of imagery and uh, data that it took as it flew nearby, again about 7,000 uh, miles above the surface, <coughs> which is why you know, it would be neat if you had a uh, Curiosity-like rover down there and able to take the time and look at this and an orbiter like the Viking orbiter had as well. And here we're just looking at the various instruments. <coughs> and again, this is the situation that you have. Space, d space, space? Deep Space Network. There are three main dishes. You know, Canberra, Australia, uh, Spain, where is that? And um, New Mexico. All right? Those are the three. So that's all you've got, and you don't have them for 100% of the time. And so it's a very slow uh, data rate that you're effectively getting the material coming down. As I stated earlier, Dr. Summers and I put together a, a children's book about Pluto. You can look it up. We published it before, and there's the guinea pig Pluto, and, you know, four children to make some analogies. Pluto likes to run around his food dish, and Pluto the planet goes around the sun. Uh, give you an idea of when you look at Pluto from afar, it doesn't look the same as when you look at Pluto up close. There's a distant image of Pluto the guinea pig and a close-up picture of Pluto the guinea pig, etc. So that's available. These are some of the other books that uh, I've been involved with. Uh, what's neat about this one, multi-generational starship design consideration. I edited this volume with contributions from my students during a course in astrobiology when we looked at the design of a starship. Yes, ma'am? What age is the uh, guinea pig? It was rated at a uh, fifth grade reading level, so that gives you an idea. I mean, I, I, I've, I've known uh, some friends' kids that, you know, they're younger and they do okay, and some that like it even a little older, but that, that's what it was rated, okay? Fifth grade reading level. <coughs> I guess that's about 10 years old, right? Give or take. Uh, I've contributed chapters to this extraterrestrial altruism, which is looking at um, extraterrestrials. Uh, as far as are they going to be belligerent or are they going to be friendly? This came out of uh, the statement made in 2010 by Stephen Hawking that he thought that we should not try to communicate with uh, any extraterrestrial civilization because they'd come and take us over and destroy us, etc. And there's a lot of reasons why uh, many astronomers, and myself included, don't believe that's true. And um, so you'll see a lot of that in here in the earlier chapters, and then they get into uh, how we might interact with extraterrestrials. <coughs> I have a large print book on with what I call the secrets of the solar system, which deals with the entire solar system, including the sun, planets, etc. And uh, this one, which was illustrated by an art student at George Mason University, you know, all the secrets of the universe. You know, the one thing, those of you who are at Alcon, gee, I guess I'm not as seasoned as the astronaut Tom Jones. I know he brought his books and had a sign thing and, you know, he was selling them as he was autographing his book. You know, I should think about doing that instead. So I did want to give a, um, some time for questions. So uh, what questions do you have? No questions? Oh, here. Yeah. Oh. It, it's not water. Yes, I believe we do. It's nitrogen. <coughs> it's now frozen nitrogen, but at one point that apparently did flow, of course. So it was nice and warm. It was so cold, warm, of course. Yeah, I know you know that. But uh, yes, sir. Any thoughts on the source of methane? The source of methane. Right. You mentioned the that. Methane is found naturally, uh, even in. Um, no, I get that. How? how did it get there? 
deposit at the time of the formation of Pluto. And or in certain regions, why are there regions that are more concentration than others, you have comets that go in there that have methane as well. So in very early on, four billion years ago or so, both of this, you know, it's starting out with some methane, it's being pounded by methane impactors, those that have methane and are differentiated and concentrated in regions. They yeah. Oh, sorry. What? Tholins. Where else have we found them in the solar system? Well, it depends on how tightly you define tholin. That's uh, one of the things. Um, I in reality, you know, we've found complex organic molecules in meteorites. There was a gentleman f selling meteorites out there. If you pick up a uh, meteorite, carbonaceous chondrites have uh, a lot of organic material. And uh, some of those. See, one of the reasons it's uh, called tholin without any uh, more detail is that's, that's the point. We don't know exactly what that is. We believe and we have evidence that there's, there's, you know, carbon-based material and exactly what that is, we don't know. Because in reality, tholins is a generic name of any group of compounds that are organically based and uh, form naturally. But what exactly they are, you would look in there. Like when Sagan and his colleagues first developed the Uri Miller experiments and saw these tholins, when they were analyzed, when they had the ability to analyze them more closely with gas chromatograph mass spectrometer and the like, they found out what some of these are. And there were some sugars, and there was even nucleotides, and some other material. So it's, the tholin is a generic name of an organic material. We'll take one more question, and then oh, anyone okay. who wants to stay later uh, can do so. Is that you? You're, no, you're I'm good. good. I'm good. You're good? You're anyone good. else, last question? Going once, twice. Harold, thank you very much. It was a great lecture. Uh, we learned a lot. Um, before you guys leave, the, the next thing's coming up today at 3 o'clock. There's a sextant demonstration on the deck with Alan Goldberg at 3 o'clock. Also, a visit to the observatory. You can get to that yourself by walking down the road to the canoes, take a ride and call that road up to the White Observatory. Joe Morris is up there. I'll lead a group if anybody wants to go leave in about uh, 10 to 3. And then 4.30, ta-da, wrap it. All right.